Year 455 after Christ. Rome has just been looted by the Vandals, this being their second looting in the last 45 years. The majestic and still powerful Rome, which only four years ago had defeated the fearsome Attila, lost most of its hopes for survival, when the Emperor Valentinian III assassinated the brilliant general Flavius Aetius in the year 454. So how important was the death of this general? How did he manage to defeat Attila's Huns, with whom the Eastern Empire had found itself totally incapable of facing them? And finally, what was the key to his success? Well, that is exactly what we are going to see next. Our story begins in the year 445, when Attila assumes the supreme command of the Huns and becomes their king. Although in previous years the Huns had collaborated with the Romans, and had mainly been used by Aetius in his disputes with other barbarian tribes, these relations had ended several years ago. In 447, Attila begins an incursion through Thrace and Illyria in which he will end up raising more than 100 cities of the Eastern Empire, and defeating three of the five powerful armies that said empire had. Finally, and after being about to take Constantinople itself, Emperor Theodosius II had no choice but to reach an agreement with him. So he had to make a payment of 6,000 pounds of gold to Attila, in addition to an annual payment of 2,100. This annual payment represented approximately between 3 and 5 percent of the income that the Eastern Empire received. Once he withdrew to his base that was located between present-day Hungary and Romania, Attila analyzed where his next military campaign should be. Attila had more and more vassals and therefore more obligations with them. So he needed more and more gold to win and keep his loyalty, and to extend his great empire. Basically by the end of 449 he had three options. Go back to attack the Eastern Empire from which he was already getting a lot of gold, attack Persia, or this time go against the Western Empire. In theory, the stronger empire of the two was the Eastern one, and it had been a couple of years since he had managed to defeat it extensively, so the supposedly weakened Western Empire shouldn't be too complicated. So, and objectively, Attila knew that the West had been fighting many wars against all kinds of barbarian peoples, so they would have to be very worn out. While Attila was debating these issues, a dispute arose between Valentinian III and her sister Honoria, who had no better idea than to send Attila a letter with her ring and a request for protection. The king of the Huns correctly interpreted this as an offer of marriage, with which he could claim half the Western Empire as his dowry, and become the new supreme general of the West. This was precisely the position that Esio had, and neither he was going to allow that to happen, nor was the Emperor Valentinian going to consent to losing half of his empire. Despite the fact that the new Emperor of the Martian East, who replaced Theodosius in 550 when he died, had just cancelled the shipment of gold to Attila and therefore broke the agreement they had, the Hunnic king ended up deciding to attack West. So, and as Julio Caesar had said 500 years before, the die was cast. For this campaign, Attila had about 60,000 troops, 15,000 of them being Huns and the rest allies of Attila and towns that he had previously conquered. To tell the truth, he could not bring many more troops because he had to leave part of his army in his territory, due to the danger of attack from the new emperor from the east. As we have indicated before, although this risk existed, it was clear that this possible Roman attack would not penetrate very far north, and after his expected quick victory over the west, he could return reinforced to his headquarters and punish Martian. Flavio Isio for his part, had a force very similar to that of Attila, and had also had to divide his army. Due to the danger that Attila would attack Italy and not Gaul as expected by the Roman general, the Emperor Valentinian and the great Italian landowners had requested that part of the Roman army be kept in the north of the Italian peninsula. Thus, Aetius had at his disposal an army of about 15,000 Romans, to which were added another 45,000 warriors provided by the Visigoths, Burgundians, Alans, Franks and Saxons. These towns were federated barbarians of Rome, and although they often entered into disputes with Rome, as a general rule, their situation would always be more favorable with the Romans than being Attila's servants. The Huns' invasion of the Western Empire began in April 451, 
after crossing the Rhine and entering Gaul. Although Ecio had already been preparing all winter, the truth is that he expected Attila's arrival a few months later. This advance was a maneuver by Attila, who started the march on the west from his main base in Hungary when it was still quite cold. It must be said that this strategy did not work out entirely well for him, as this weakened his horses enough that they did not find enough food during this tour. In any case, Attila began to sack Gallic cities with the intention of attracting all the territory as well as its population and federated barbarian peoples to his side, to later go to Rome. On the other hand, Flavio Isio's strategy was for Attila to wear himself out in the continuous sieges, with which he would end up attracting Attila to the city of Orleans that the Roman general had reinforced. The order that had been given to the local garrison is that they resist until the deadline of June 14th, this being the moment in which Aetius would arrive with his troops and face the worn-out Attila. The siege of Orleans was much more difficult than Attila had anticipated, and after weeks of combat, he was finally able to enter the city on June 14th. While his troops were breaking into Orleans, Aetius arrived with his armies and there was a disorganized battle in which Attila was defeated and had to retreat. This victory was due to the fact that Attila's army was in disarray and was taken practically by surprise. From this point a chase began, in which Attila fled in an easterly direction, with Aetius hot on his heels. After about a week of pursuit, Attila finally stopped and prepared for the final battle against Aetius, which is now known as the Battle of the Catalonic Fields, which took place about 130 kilometers southeast of present-day Paris. This battle took place in quite favorable conditions for Aetius, since Attila's troops were very exhausted after four months of campaign, and his morale had been greatly reduced after his defeat in Orleans to what this flight had followed. In this battle, Aetius placed the Alanos in the center of his formation, the Visigoths on the right and he occupied the hill on the left flank. Attila moved into the center of his formation, and put the Ostrogoths and Jepids on his flanks. Briefly, the battle consisted of a series of frontal charges made by Attila, hoping to break the lines of Aetius in the center, which the Alanos occupied. Finally, the Alanos maintained their position after retreating a bit, and both the Romans and the Visigoths fell on the flanks of Attila, who had no choice but to withdraw. After the battle, Isio was able to kill Attila, who was already preparing to commit suicide before falling into Roman hands. Finally, the Roman general decided to let Attila escape in order to keep alive his coalition of Roman and barbarian armies, as well as his political and military weight within the empire. If Attila had disappeared, it is very possible that all those peoples would have gone to war among themselves and it would have been chaos again, just as it would end up happening a few years later after the death of Aetius and Attila. In any case, after this disastrous campaign, Attila had to return to his territory, and there he prepared for the next campaign in the year 552. On this occasion, he would not attack only at one point, but would do so simultaneously in Gaul and Italy, leading the incursion through the north of present-day Italy. For this defensive campaign Aetius had fewer troops, since the vast majority of the Visigothic, Alan, Burgundian, and Frankish allies did not go to northern Italy because they had to face the other army that Attila had sent to his territory. This second army of Attila was defeated by the Visigothic king Turismundo. Thus, Aetius did not have enough troops to present a pitched battle to Attila, so he only limited himself to harassing him and trying to cut off his supply lines, with the sole intention of wearing down Attila's army. King Huno for his part, was able to sack the important cities of Aquileia and Mediolanum, after long and fierce sieges. In any case, it was of little use to him, and the only thing that happened was that his army was dwindling day by day. With little food and numerous epidemics and diseases plaguing his army, Attila had to withdraw from Italy and return to his base also because news of an attack by Emperor Marciano on his territory had arrived. Although Attila's intention was to return the following year, and this time without assaulting Rome, he died in 453 after a great drunkenness during another of his weddings. The great victorious general Aetius, who had managed to stop Attila himself, did so in a way that did not please the Roman landowners, who had seen how Aetius had left his properties undefended at the mercy of the Huns. 
it seems they didn't understand the strategy of attrition and scorched earth. Thus, the great Roman aristocrats did not sympathize with Aetius's proposals to make them pay more taxes in order to maintain the Roman army, and various disputes with the Emperor Valentinian over the marriage of the Emperor's daughter with the son of Aetius, made the general fell out of favor. It all ended for him when in the year 454, a series of senators, powerful men, and the Emperor Valentinian III himself decided to end the life of Aesio, in a totally fateful act for Rome. As we have said at the beginning of the program, one year after the assassination of Aetius, Rome was sacked by the Vandals. It is clear that with him, the last hope that the empire had to survive disappeared, and a series of dark characters like Ricky Mero ended up completely sinking the empire during the following years. From this point there were three last fleeting opportunities for the empire, led by Avino, Maoriano, and Anthemio, who tried to recover the vital north of Africa, but all their attempts failed. Finally the last Roman emperor Romulus Augustus was deposed in the year 476, and with him, the end of the Western Empire was officially established. If you want to analyze this whole process in greater depth, I leave you in the description the extraordinary program that we had a few weeks ago with Jose Soto Chica about the fall of the Roman Empire. Well, here is this program which I hope you have been of interest. Thank you all for being part of this community, and especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and we'll see each other here as always, next Thursday and Sunday. See you soon.